Yes, it worked. Know about protecting IP. Um, we're really happy to have you here and um, stay tuned. It will be about, uh, well, we'll see how long, maybe 45 minutes to an hour, just discussing uh, everything you need to know about uh, how to protect your IP. Um, and I've got a great okay. guest. I'll, I will get to it in a minute. Let's move to the next slide. Oh, and if everybody could make sure you mute yourself and um, we will also be having some questions and try to make this as interactive as we can. So there's a chat box there if you do ever want to ask some questions. Um, and we will also have a, a specific time for questions at the end. So one of the reasons that we started to put this together was because the, the research is really clear that startups were three times more likely to be successful if they had one patent and five times more if they had multiple patents. So it became, um, and, and Rock, who I'm gonna introduce in, in a minute, brought this to our attention, and we've also been really researching around innovation and IP, and it's become very obvious that this is what we need to, to be doing. So just keep that in mind and just move over to the next slide. So to tell you uh, who I am, I'm Diane Curry-Sam. I'm with the Foresight Clean Tech Accelerator Center in uh, Vancouver, BC. I'm the communications manager. And one of the fun things about my job is to be able to bring you some very good content, which leads me to the next slide. This is our guest speaker for today. I'd like to introduce and, and, and warmly welcome Rock Ripley from Gow Gowling WLG, the Intellectual Property Group. Um, Rock is a lawyer and patent agent with a degree in electronics engineering, and he is the head of Gowling WLG Vancouver's Intellectual Property Group. So I'm gonna turn over the content and the presentation to Rock, and, and thank you so much for coming, Rock, and if you could kind of take it from here. Sure, Diane, thanks very much. Um, and welcome to everybody who's attending. Um, as Diane said, uh, I am a patent agent and lawyer with Gowling WLG here in Vancouver. I head our IP group, which is uh, 18 people in the city. Um, my practice is uh, almost entirely focused on patent work in the physical sciences, uh, and that includes a significant clean tech base. Um, so I'm here today to talk uh, about three things we, um, or I think, it's important for clean tech companies to know about IP um, and to share some experiences uh, I've had um, servicing clients in the space that you may find useful. So at a high level, the agenda today, um, we're going to talk uh, big picture, patents and prosperity. We're going to talk about uh, the motivation underlying protection of IP. And I'll uh, just note here that uh, the presentation makes several references to IP. When I talk about IP in this presentation, there are a lot of forms of IP, it includes copyright and trademarks, but really I'm talking primarily about patents, also a bit about trade secrets. Um, and I'll note when I'm doing that, those are the two kinds of IP rights that protect functionality of inventions. Um, we'll talk about uh, when to protect IP, how to decide what to patent, uh, some pitfalls, what to avoid and what you can do to avoid them, and a formal Q&A session at the end. Uh, if you have any questions along the way, please don't feel free or don't feel like you need to wait until the end to ask. Feel free to ask at any time. Diane will be monitoring that chat box and if there's something uh, uh, she thinks uh, is appropriate for the time, she'll just jump in and interrupt me. And of course, Diane, feel free to do that. Um, so to start, I, I want to talk big picture uh, and what motivated uh, me, um, you know, to, to talk to Foresight and to research this topic more above and beyond the fact that I'm an IP lawyer, because we all make choices when we decide how to apply our skills. A lot of you are going to be entrepreneurs who could have decided, well, uh, I could start a company or work for a company in many spaces. You've chosen clean tech. Similarly, when I look at the Canadian economy and where we stand relative to other advanced nations, I think to myself, well, what's going to best position our country for growth in um, BC specifically, because I'm located in Vancouver, but not exclusively. I know Foresight's reach is across the Western provinces as well. So if you're tuning in uh, from Alberta or Saskatchewan, then I think everything I'm saying in this talk is going to uh, apply to those provinces 
uh, equally as it applies to BC. Um, so here in BC, historically, we've relied, I would say, disproportionately for a first world economy on uh, the resource sector for prosperity. And I think as we've all seen recently, not just with COVID-19, but trade disputes and international politics and uh, technology disrupting the need for certain traditional industries, that uh, I don't think is an ideal long-term plan if we want to stay prosperous. So for a long time now, uh, BC and Canada, of course, generally has been transitioning towards embracing the tech sector um, to drive economic growth. And I think we need to continue down that road to be successful. And uh, I think success, in my definition, includes commercialization. Uh, without commercialization, we're basically performing R&D for the sake of R&D and giving the windfall of that investment um, to a large degree to uh, foreign companies and countries that can then go and successfully commercialize it. Generally speaking, other countries do it better. So I, I think it's correct to say because of the fact that uh, historically we, we started very resource intensive and although we're transitioning, we could do a better job commercializing that we are in fact still in transition. So from an IP perspective, that's true. According to the World Intellectual Property Organization, WIPO, we're 14th in the world in terms of uh, patent filings. Um, we have the 10th largest economy. Um, in terms of aggregate numbers, the Chinese and the Americans by far are the largest filers. Um, China in particular, their growth has been increasing exponentially the last several years. A lot of that growth has been domestic Chinese filings, which uh, tend to be relatively inexpensive and frankly, relatively low quality. But a lot of that growth as well have been higher uh, value international filings where they'll file an international application and then uh, use that to springboard into five, six, seven other countries. So there's been a growth both in their lower value domestic market and their higher value international market. Um, Per capita, Korea and Japan, perhaps unsurprisingly, are some of the highest filers in, uh, in the world. Uh, our gross expenditures here in BC on R&D, it's 1.4% of our GDP compared to an OECD average of 2.4%. That equates to roughly two and a half billion short of the OECD average. And IP leakage um, is a problem. What's IP leakage? Well, it includes uh, IP being generated and protected and then being sold or divested to uh, uh, companies outside of Canada, but it also includes R&D being performed and not properly protected with IP. So a loss of chance of commercialization. And I think all that is indicative of the fact that we've still got a ways to go. And part of what I hope to do here is to um, give you the information you need so that when you're making decisions day in, day out, running your companies, you, you'll know what you have to do to continue the successful progression of our economy um, to, to one that is uh, reliant uh, uh, and embraces technology for growth and prosperity. Um, if you're interested, the last two numbers, the last two statistics I cited, the, the GDP number 1.4% versus 2.4% in the discussion on IP leakage, those are actually from a couple of reports that were fairly recently published by the province. One is the final report of the Emergency Economy, Emerging Economy Task Force. You can see that on your screen now. Uh, another is the report of BC's uh, outgoing uh, Innovation Commissioner, Alan Winter. Uh, both of those reports talk about clean tech and they talk about IP as being important to the future of BC's economy. So if it's something you want to uh, read more about, those reports are available to you. So jumping right in, um, planning, when should you protect your IP? When you make these decisions? And um, the answer um, is at the outset. And I'll also take this opportunity to say that at a macro level, uh, it's not too early as a company, if you're a small and medium-sized enterprise in SME, to start patenting. It's not something that you need to do or that you should wait to do until you're a large company. Certainly, large companies uh, 
do file a disproportionately high number of patents, may have dedicated budgets and teams. But uh, having a, a patent portfolio when you're a smaller company um, can do a lot of good for you. And in fact, the patent system can be used uh, as a, a tool to level the playing field between smaller and larger companies to a certain degree. You know, one of the most famous patents in the world probably is Amazon.com's one-click patent, which is kind of uh, lambasted in the press because it's uh, a patent for one-click ordering of online goods. Um, and Amazon, of course, now, I, I saw an article today, Forbes is ranking Bezos again as the richest person in the world. But when they applied for that patent application, um, probably nearly 20 years ago now, they, they were the upstart. So they were the SME and they uh, used that patent and that patent got litigated against, at that time, um, the entrenched player, Barnes and Noble, and Amazon won. Um, they've also licensed that patent. You go to Apple's website, you're about to make an order. They, they have that one-click patent under license. So they are very early in their development as an SME. Amazon um, used IP to, to strengthen its position against established players um, and uh, used it quite successfully. So uh, certainly not too early for SMEs, generally speaking, to, to protect their IP. Um, in terms of the micro level decisions you're making, uh, plan at the outset, um, I think for a couple of reasons. One, you wanna, during R&D, uh, at the beginning of it, budget the amount you're gonna need uh, to, to file patents. You're looking at around, um, I always say, over the course of a full year of filing, your first year, somewhere between $15,000 and $20,000 uh, for a standalone um, invention to get a full application on file. Depending on the strategy you employ, you might be able to shift that cost towards the end of the year rather than the beginning. And of course, if you have a group of related inventions, for example, several that are directed at the same product for similar technology, you're going to get a bit of an economy of scale if you file multiple applications. But just as a ballpark, that 15 to 20K number is the one I use. Um, Another benefit of setting aside the budget at the outset is that uh, IP stays top of mind so that when you're going through your product development cycle, you, you can get to a place where you have lots of time to prepare applications, to instruct outside counsel, to file, to make decisions, as opposed to the place where you uh, are going to be shipping in a week and you realize, wow, maybe we should protect this. And then all of a sudden it's a huge rush to get your ducks in a row. So for that reason, I think planning early is really important. You also want to file early uh, and no later than disclosure, disclosure or commercialization of your product. Um, and we'll discuss it a bit later, but disclosure or commercialization is a, a trigger point for when you can shoot yourself in the foot because by self-disclosing, your invention is no longer new and therefore you can no longer patent it. And in certain cases, even secret commercial use can, can count as a disclosure. So you definitely, best practices to file before you disclose or commercialize. Um, you want to consider as well freedom to operate uh, before your product design is finalized. So when I'm talking about filing, that's creation of your own IP assets. Freedom to operate is avoiding the uh, um, uh, avoiding other people's IP assets. So making sure that even if you don't have patents protecting your product, if you sell your own product, you're not going to get sued for infringement. Um, this is particularly important because if you're seeking investment or acquisition from larger companies down the road, a lot of those larger companies are risk averse. So they're going to ask you to confirm that there's no infringement of third party IP rights when they're about to give you money or acquire you. Now you'll always be asked, you'll always have to deal with it in the, uh, uh, the investment agreement uh, or the purchase agreement. Uh, it could be as simple as making a representation and warranty. You may be able to water it down through knowledge or liability caps and things like that. Um, but sometimes I've had uh, large companies come to my clients and say, listen, the, the warranty or the contractual wording isn't good enough. We actually want you to do the search or we want you to show that you've done the searches in the countries where you have um, uh, an interest and you're going to sell. And we want to see the analysis as to why you think there's no infringement. 
So there've been a few times where we've had to walk um, um, opposing counsel through that, satisfy them that, look, of course, there's always a risk. We can't say it's zero, but we've done our due diligence here. We've mitigated it and you should feel comfortable. Uh, and then, you know, in uh, the cases I'm thinking of, they, they have and they proceed with the investment. Um, but it's something you may want to consider doing proactively before your design is finalized, while it's doing a search. And you want to do it before your design is finalized because you may have to change your product to avoid third party patents. And you want to periodically review these, uh, your plan from time to time, the decisions you've made. So as you're developing new inventions in your pipeline, you want to review the stuff you have under confidential R&D uh, to see if you want to patent them. Um, if you've already filed, you want to review those pending applications to see if it's worth continuing to spend the time and money to argue with examiners um, to, to try to secure rights. And if you've got granted cases, you want to review them from time to time to make sure that uh, uh, they can justify their maintenance fees. Um, for all these patent rights, every country requires you pay some kind of fee on some kind of regular basis to keep your rights in force. Typically, it's annually on the order of hundreds of dollars. So in isolation, not that big a deal. But if you have a portfolio um, covering uh, multiple products uh, or multiple patents covering a particular product uh, in different countries, that can add up. Also in the United States, kind of uh, uh, an outlier in many ways, um, <laughs> they have um, uh, maintenance fees where you only pay them every three or four years. So there each fee costs on the order of thousands of dollars because you're only paying them infrequently and it's a bit more of a reason to revisit before payment. So if that's the plan, um, why are we doing it? Um, uh, a few reasons. One, your classic reason, a, a marketplace moat. Um, what, what I mean by that? Well, IP and patents in particular protect the fruits of your R&D. So if you get a patent for a product, it stops other people from making, using, or selling that product, regardless of whether they independently created it or not, regardless of whether they were even aware of your product before they started selling their own. Um, you can sue to enforce. And often when I say that, people immediately become disinterested because they say, well, look, I'm never going to be able to afford to enforce. Enforcement is going to cost a couple of million uh, dollars. So therefore, the patent right is useless to me. Um, and I would say that is uh, uh, an, an incorrect way to look at the value proposition because very few patents are litigated, um, but they still have value um, because a lot of larger companies um, in particular, uh, and maybe counterintuitively because of the resource they have can be risk averse. They don't want to enter a field where they're going to get sued for infringement. Um, and I've had one case actually where it wasn't clean tech, it was a different field where um, we notified a, a, a retailer and we were the little guy uh, about how uh, that retailer's house brand was actually infringing in our rights. Um, and they said, Sorry, <laughs> we'll take it down where we, we were unaware. Um, and that's a case where the right resulted in a favorable outcome without having to go to litigation. So just because, yes, absolutely, it is really expensive to enforce beginning to end. Uh, enforcement is relatively rare. Um, uh, and just because it hasn't been enforced through a, a, a trial that goes to, to final judgment doesn't mean that um, they haven't been respected or valued. Um, plus, even if you are in that um, unlikely uh, situation where you do have to enforce, uh, a lot of times starting an action is a part of negotiation. So the overall cost of an action, absolutely, it's expensive to take a case to trial, even in Canada, all the way through to completion, you're looking at over a million dollars. Uh, and it's more in the United States. Um, uh, by starting the action and working way through the process, you end up getting to a place where both parties decide it's in their interest to settle. Uh, but even apart from that, because enforcement is relatively rare, I tend not to focus on it too much um, because there are other benefits to having the patent assets. One is valuation. Um, when you're trying to attract investment or you're gonna put yourself up for sale for an exit, 
uh, uh, the companies that are going to be looking to invest in you actually do have the resources to enforce those rights. They probably have existing portfolios, so they're going to view those rights differently from an enforcement perspective than you will. So um, they're going to uh, uh, attribute uh, valuations to that. Um, we've got another um, company now that's in the process of uh, winding up and their IP is going to net them a significant windfall at wind up. So there is a valuation aspect to it as well. And collaboration opportunities, um, joint development and collaboration is becoming more and more common where your catalog of IP assets can be cross licensed as, uh, uh, as part of that deal. So you and the people you're working with may cross license um, their background IP to each other. Um, and also, uh, you may want to have a line in the sand before you start collaborating with someone to show exactly what it is you brought to the table. And instead of some kind of amorphous description that's hidden away in lab notebooks about the IP you're bringing to the table, it's a little easier to delineate what you owned at a certain date if you can actually point to a standalone document um, like a patent that's been filed with a government agency. So there are various reasons why you'd want to protect over and above the classic enforcement paradigm. So Rock, just uh, just interrupting, a, yeah. um, Vladimir Grebenyak just commented, maybe you could address it. I've heard stories when big company just crushes the small company, knowing that they are unable to defend themselves. I mean, you kind of mentioned that a little bit at the, the beginning, but uh, yeah. related sure. to- Sure, yeah, and that, that can happen too, absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, you're, you're, you're playing the odds, right? Like in a large marketplace with lots of smaller companies and lots of larger companies, you can have cases where larger companies um, decide to fight everything tooth and nail and make it very difficult for smaller companies to enforce. There's a certain percentage of cases where that happens. Um, there are also a certain percentage of cases uh, where the situation I described earlier happens and larger companies being risk averse and having established IP policies and being concerned about um, the legal tools that can be levied against them, like punitive damages and uh, horrendous press, um, decide not to fight tooth and nail. Um, where I'd say uh, what you've described probably happens most frequently is in the patent troll context where um, uh, the entire business model of the, the patent owner is to sue and they really don't care about countersuits or uh, because they don't make use or sell anything. So there is no countersuit option. So I'd say that's probably the most common scenario um, in, you know, in which case, yeah, that's, that's where freedom to operate searches come into play. Okay. Um, and also my assumption is that if you have a good patent lawyer, they, they're going to be watching out for those scenarios and advising you on that. Yeah. Uh, the, it's certainly something we consider. I mean, again, that's, that's right up the alley of freedom to operate. Mm -hmm. um, and if you do get sued, another reason, um, uh, the, the, your own portfolio can be helpful. I, I mentioned it in respect of collaboration, but it can also be useful in terms of settlement. Um, not with patent trolls who uh, don't usually care too much about the cross licensing, but if you're dealing with an established player, um, a, a cross licensing or deal uh, where you put your own assets on the table can be a uh, uh, part of a settlement and, and you know, um, act in lieu of some kind of cash payment or something like that. So uh, the bargaining chips are, are useful. Um, so I don't think it's a foregone conclusion that, uh, that if you go into a space um, and you were in a position where a, a large company was infringing your rights, you would just get sued into oblivion. Um, I just, is it a theoretical possibility? Yes. Does it happen sometimes? Yeah. But I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say that's par for the course. Okay. Good. Thank you. Um, we talk about planning. Here, here's a graph showing, I would say, kind of your, your classic example 
of a filing strategy where you're an SME and you want to defer costs. Um, so in terms of when you file a first application that serves as your priority document called a US provisional, I've labeled a USP there, um, that buys you 12 months until you file an international application called a PCT application. And that buys you another 18 months until you actually have to make the filing decision of when you wanna uh, pursue protection in individual countries. Um, the reason this system exists is basically to defer costs in the, uh, um, in the protection process. Um, so, like I said earlier, the combination of the US provisional and the PCT in that first year, it's probably gonna be between 15 and $20,000. You can shift the cost between the two, depending on how you draft it and your, your markets and when you're gonna disclose and things like that. Um, then you've got 18 months of deferral and your next big cost milestone is when you have to go, it's called going national, uh, when you file those national applications, you know, US, Canada, Europe, China, Japan, and that's when you have to pay translation fees and filing fees in all those countries. And um, hence the two and a half years of deferral until that point. So question again, um, again from Vladimir, um, what would you say about filing provisional being a public disclosure and letting everyone else know about your IP? So he's asking about that filing the provisional and whether that's a public disclosure. So filing a provisional is not a public disclosure. Filing a provisional, um, uh, doesn't count as a disclosure. It's a confidential document. Provisional is held confidential for that 12 month period that I've shown on the screen. If you don't file um, a non-provisional application like a PCT within the end of that 12 month period, then it's never disclosed. Uh, if you do file uh, a non-provisional application like that PCT, uh, the PCT and the US provisional are disclosed 18 months from your US provisional filing. So six months after your PCT filing. Um, so that, I think that, that's, that's one way I could interpret the question. <laughs> the other way I guess is, is there a point to just publicly disclosing your invention um, and, and uh, uh, putting it out there in the world? Uh, there are some, you know, there are some companies uh, where for certain inventions they'll do that and they'll do that so that uh, no one else can get a patent for that same technology. So in order to get a patent your tech has to be new. So if you know you don't want to patent something and you don't want anyone else to get a patent for something you can just publicly disclose your invention. You wouldn't do it via US provisional. You could you know draft a white paper and publish it on your website or publish it in a, a conference proceeding or something like that. Um, and then as of the publication date, no one can, um, no one can get a patent for that technology. Uh, I certainly, you, you don't want to do that for your key technology, um, <laughs> cause you're basically putting your, your key technology into the public domain then. Um, but some, sometimes people say, you know what, this invention is really marginal. I don't think we're going to commercialize it, but I really don't want to be surprised by it down the road if someone else independently creates it and gets a patent for it. And then I end up commercializing. it. I don't want it enforced against me. So there are times like that when you can publicly disclose an invention to sort of poison the well, no one gets a patent for it. Um, but I, I wouldn't do that for my key tech and you wouldn't do it with a US provisional. Okay, good. And again, a reason why to have a good advisor on your team, right? Who understands all these strategies. So. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that, what I've got on the screen is, is your, your classic cost deferral uh, example, which I just walked us through. Here's another way you can do it. I actually kind of prefer this way, um, where the difference between these slides is instead of filing a US provisional at the outset and then filing my non-provisional US uh, two and a half years from then off the PCT, you, you, you replace your US provisional with your, your non-provisional US, and then everything else stays the same. The benefit of this is that the, the US system, um, the examination system is queue based. So as soon as you file, you automatically are placed in the examination queue, and you just hurry up and wait um, for an examiner to pick up the application and, and, uh, and to argue back and forth with you as to whether you can get a patent for your invention. That in the clean tech space takes, I would say 12 and 16 months for the examiner to get to. 
So a benefit of doing it this way is you hop into the examination queue a little bit earlier. Um, and by the time you've got to make the decision of whether to file in Canada, Europe, China, Japan, or wherever else, you have the benefit already, most likely, of the results of US prosecution. So a lot of times you've already got a granted US patent by the time you have to decide whether to file outside the US. Uh, and that can really inform your decision as to whether to file. Because the US examiner may have found some, uh, um, some uh, uh, other prior art that you weren't aware of that uh, may narrow the scope of protection you can get. Or you may decide to amend your foreign application to correspond with your allowed US patent to try to expedite the process in other jurisdictions. So this is also quite a handy way to uh, give you a little more certainty up front and um, um, to get you to a US grant, of course, a very large market a little faster. So in terms of planning, what should you patent? Um, I'll typically walk clients through uh, a few factors. One, we, we've got, um, usually I'll ask clients, keep a database, keep a spreadsheet of all the stuff you're working on, all the stuff that you are keeping secret, that's confidential, that, that potentially you may want to protect through patents. And then we'll, we'll rank each of those innovations um, according to their commercial value and according to their technical merits. So of course, commercial value, what is the uh, uh, advantage this uh, innovation is giving you in the marketplace vis-a-vis -vis your competitors? And the technical value, just how technically cool, meritorious is it? How much skill or inventive is it, regardless of how commercially valuable that invention may be? Um, and it's those two in combination, how valuable it is um, being represented by the commercial aspect and how likely it is I'm going to be able to convince an examiner to get us the patent represented by its technical value that leads us to um, a ranking of your trade secrets. And you compare that ranking towards your allocated budget and you can figure out what you want to uh, protect and what doesn't um, uh, pass the bar, so to speak. You also want to consider um, which of your innovations, in fact, are going to be reverse engineerable once you uh, commercialize them. So particularly in clean tech, if you're selling uh, heavy equipment uh, or uh, any kind of tangible equipment to third parties, as soon as that equipment is sold, your third parties, your customers are going to be able to take it apart to reverse engineer it. And if they're going to be able to reverse engineer it, you actually don't have the option of keeping the invention secret. It's in terms of proprietary uh, intellectual property, it's going to be a patent on that product or it's going to be nothing. Because if it's reverse engineerable, the law says there, there is no such thing as trade secret protection. Um, so if it's reverse engineerable, um, the decision becomes a little more straightforward in that, well, if you want IP protection at all, um, in terms of how the invention works, it's going to have to be through patents. And then another um, criteria to consider is even if it's not reverse engineerable, um, upon sale, once a competitor sees what you've sold and is, say, inspired by it, how long would it take for that competitor to independently create that invention? If it's going to be a very short time, then it is, uh, uh, that, that is something that lends um, uh, or that tends towards patenting. Because again, the legal prejudice to filing the patent is the fact that your invention is disclosed. Um, filing a patent means, like I mentioned earlier, that your uh, invention is disclosed 18 months from filing, and that could be a really bad thing, particularly if the patent at the end of the day is refused. So that, that's one reason people don't file. But if your competitors, after seeing you commercialize, are going to be able to independently recreate uh, your successful product fairly easily anyway, then there's much less of a downside to proceeding with filing. Uh, and there are particular pitfalls I want to mention as well. So inadvertent disclosure, um, I alluded to this earlier. You don't want to be in a place where uh, you've already made sales or you're going to be making sales in like five days and you suddenly realize, wow, maybe we should protect this with patents because once you have publicly disclosed 
you, you really prejudice your patent rights, which we'll get to more in, in a minute. Um, I will note that the United States in particular has a bit of a different regime for what constitutes a disclosure. Um, everywhere outside the US, uh, generally speaking, um, you've got to make what's called an enabling disclosure. So uh, whatever you've made available to the public has to be reverse engineerable uh, in order to prejudice your, your patent rights. Whereas in the US, even if you have some kind of secret sale or secret commercialization, um, that can effectively count as a disclosure. So not all countries are created equally in terms of, in terms of the law. Um, you really want to avoid ownership disputes. Now, this is ancillary to patents, but with all your employees, all your developers, you, you want to make sure that uh, whatever employment or consulting agreement they sign also has clauses assigning all the IP rights to you uh, because developers and inventors are much more amenable to signing that from the outset than if you go back to them a year or two down the road and say, hey, you know, we identified something particularly valuable here. Can you assign it over to us now? Because that's what we always attended, intended, right? Well, I find more often than not, people say, no, not right. Um, that's not what the intention was. And you can get disputes into ownership, which even if you solve them at the end of the day, are a real pain in terms of time and money. Uh, related to this, uh, again, in terms of country specific differences in the United States, um, every inventor um, is required to sign what's called an inventor declaration when you file a US application that's separate from ownership. Um, and you want to get those forms signed early on too, because if uh, um, you tend to it late and there's a delay, maybe an inventor becomes unable, uncooperative, or it's impossible to reach him or her it can be a real administrative headache down the road um, to deal with it later rather than sooner. So you wanna get all the documents signed up front, particularly ownership. And that's something that everyone who's investing in you, I would say 100% of the time is gonna investigate with due diligence. You want a proper security infrastructure, physical and uh, cyber security and the proper confidentiality language in, um, in the contracts of everyone who has access to your IP. Because without that, even if in fact there's been no leak of your IP um, or inadvertent disclosure of your, your uh, uh, trade secrets, if you ever went to enforce your trade secrets against somebody, say an employee hopped to a competitor and you think they've taken your confidential and proprietary inventions and um, are now uh, giving them to, an invent to a competitor to use, um, if you haven't got a proper um, confidentiality or secrecy infrastructure in place and you go to enforce, a court might say, well, you know what, you never took reasonable measures to protect your confidential information in the first place. So um, we're not going to recognize any trade secret rights you have and, and that's it. There, there is no IP in the product. Other people are free to use what you thought was confidential before and you get what I referred to earlier as leakage. You, you, you get that information leaving the confines of your company and going to your competitors and then being free to use it. So certainly you want to avoid that. Um, and given the importance of exporting to not just BC companies, but Canadian um, companies generally, you don't want to treat all, um, all the countries you want to secure patent rights in um, and you will want to secure internationally if you're going to export, you don't want to treat them all uh, equally because they're not all the same, even though there are some unifying general principles um, that, that most countries uh, adhere to. So for example, um, China has a very protected domestic market. So when I talk about ownership disputes, if you end up outsourcing some R&D to China, um, you can't just get them to sign a contract that would work in Canada or the United States. You need it vetted by a local Chinese council to make sure it's enforceable because they have very strict rules as to IP that can be transferred to offshore or non-Chinese companies. Um, also, the letter of the law may be the same, for example, in respect of um, what various offices say they'll do. The European office and the US and Canadian offices um, all say, for example, 
that after you file, you can't amend the application in a way that adds what's called new matter. You can't add new stuff to an application after filing. But in practice, the European office takes a much, much stricter view of that than the American and uh, uh, Canadian offices. So that's really gonna affect your, your filing strategy up front and your prosecution strategy, the arguments you advance to an examiner if you get a rejection. Um, in our office in Vancouver, we actually have three European patent agents on staff um, um, and part of the partnership who are, who are working with us, helping our clients in that regard. Um, uh, and of course, the US market, um, you know, probably top of mind for Canadians. Um, I probably do more work in the US than in Canada, um, simply because their economy is 10 times larger. Uh, and there are nuances there in respect, um, I mentioned earlier, declarations, appeal process, disclosure requirements. Uh, so you definitely want to keep all those top of mind as well. Uh, and that's something um, skilled and experienced counsel can help with. And I do think actually Canadian counsel is particularly well positioned to help on the international front because um, I've dealt with um, a lot of U.S. attorneys, because the U.S. market is so massive, twenty trillion dollars, you you can do I mean, frankly quite well just focusing on the U.S. market. Uh, but because the Canadian market is a, a tenth that size, in fact, under a tenth that size, we're basically Texas. Um, <laughs> uh, all all Canadian companies look internationally for growth. So I find Canadian patent lawyers tend to have a very good uh, perspective when it comes to taking into account not just Canadian, but US, European, Chinese, what have you, um, issues. So I'll take you through now uh, a few of the common pitfalls I've seen, which I would like not to see from anybody attending this webinar. One is um, something called the quick and dirty US provisional. Um, these used to be a lot more common and I see them falling out of favor now, which I think is a good thing. So a quick and dirty US provisional is one where, for example, you file something pretty informal with a US patent office. This could be a design specification, could be something you wrote yourself, could be something that resembles a patent application, except it doesn't have a full claim set, which is where we define the invention and the various layers of the invention, the various elements that you may find in certain examples of the invention, but not in others. Um, you file that to save money up front. Then 12 months later at the PCT stage, you, you, you spend the money to flesh it out. And then 18 months later, you go national like I talked about before. But the problem here is that I find often there's a disconnect between the protection people think they're getting from these quick and dirty provisionals and the protection in fact they actually get. So if you file a uh, quick and dirty US provisional, um, that discloses, let's say, a pretty narrow example of your invention. Let's say you've just developed a prototype, um, a particular kind of wind, turb wind turbine with a uh, novel blade shape and some modifications to the electronics. And you describe this turbine with a novel blade shape and electronics modifications. And let's say the blade shape is much more important than the electronics modifications. Um, because really, you could, you could commercialize existing turbines by outfitting them or retrofitting them with a new blade without changing any of the electronics. Then after a US provisional thinking you're protected, you go and you make sales, you file your PCT and then down the road, you, uh, um, you file uh, internationally. Well, the problem in countries like Europe and China is that your sales after your US provisional are going to invalidate all your patent rights unless you can say, listen, everything I want protection for is disclosed in my first filing, my US provisional filing. Well, like I mentioned earlier, the European office and the Chinese office as well take a very strict view as to, um, as to the amount of overlap you need between your PCT application and your US provisional application in order to give you the benefit of that US provisional application. So what they say is, well, you know what, really in this PCT application, you say the invention is the shape of the turbine blade. 
And it doesn't matter if um, you use that turbine blade with the electronics you disclosed in your US provisional. But because you disclose the turbine blade in combination with the electronics in your US provisional, that's all we're gonna give you protection for. So um, you can find yourself in a position where in Europe and in China, um, you have a patent that is limited to the specific example you provided in your US provisional and not to really what's commercially valuable. In US and Canada, um, we're a lot more forgiving because um, if you make a sale within 12 months of your first filing, that can't be held against you. So often it's not a big problem in the US and Canada, but in Europe and China, it definitely is a big problem. It's a pretty common one to boot. Um, here's another issue we see um, probably most commonly a couple times a year actually from, uh, from the US where I just mentioned that in the US and Canada, if you uh, make a disclosure, you've got one year from, your that, from that disclosure to still file and still protect your rights. Well, along the line of not treating all countries identically, um, in certain countries, you are okay to, um, excuse me, uh, uh, in certain countries to invoke the benefit of that grace period, you actually have to file an application in that country or file a PCT application. In other countries, you're allowed to uh, rely on a provisional application or some other kind of uh, foreign application. So in the US, you are allowed to rely on a provisional application to invoke the benefit of that one year grace period. So you could have a disclosure at day one, wait 12 months, file a US provisional, um, wait another 12 months and then file a US non-provisional. And assuming your US provisional and US non-provisional are identical, you would be fine in terms of getting protection in the US for what you disclosed on day one. But you wouldn't be fine for anywhere else there because in Canada, you actually need a Canadian filing or PCT filing as of uh, uh, at the one year mark. And in Europe and China, there's no grace period whatsoever. Japan, I'll talk to you a little bit more on a slide, but uh, again, not all countries were created equally. Um, if you want to remedy that situation I just showed, um, you could bring forward certain filings. So um, in that top timeline, um, the US filing, you can leave where it was. You can bring forward the Canadian filing. So it's also filed at one year uh, from your first disclosure and that would be fine. You can bring forward the Japanese filing as well. Japan also has a grace period, but another international tweak is that you have to actively invoke the grace period and describe the disclosures you want it to cover. Canada and the US, you don't have to do that. And if you don't actively invoke the grace period at the time of filing in Japan, you don't get the benefit of it. So another international nuance to remember. Um, the bottom slide, or not the bottom slide, the bottom timeline I've got there, uh, another way to enjoy the benefit of that grace period with further cost deferral, you file a PCT at this 12 month mark instead of directly in Canada and Japan and that PCT application um, gives you the benefit of the grace period. You still have to actively invoke it in Japan though. So to conclude, um, there's a strong correlation uh, at the macro and micro level. So at, in terms of national economies and in terms of how particular companies do uh, between being able to successfully economically capitalize on innovation and uh, patenting. Uh, you wanna plan uh, early uh, both so that you can be sure to have the money set aside in both so IP is top of mind um, and you want to revisit that strategy and the execution periodically all the way through to grant when you're paying maintenance fees. You don't want to shoot yourself in the foot, uh, particularly with uh, uh, ensuring your contracts um, say that you own the IP that you pay for and in terms of uh, secrecy. So in terms of having uh, confidentiality language, proper physical and cybersecurity and avoiding inadvertent or unexpected disclosures. Um, and you want to be mindful of international considerations as well, because almost certainly for scaling in clean tech, you'll be exporting and you'll be exporting to places like Europe and Japan and China, where uh, patent laws, um, even if according to the letter of the law, they're very similar, as 
in terms of how they're applied, they can be applied quite differently from each other and how they're applied in Canada and the US. So that's what I've got prepared. Um, if you have any uh, questions, I'm happy to take them now. I'm also happy to talk uh, offline after the webinar. Excellent, thank you. I do have uh, one from Vladimir again that I didn't uh, didn't want to interrupt your flow, but it's, here it is. He's sure. asking, um, how about the opposite when I don't want to file and I don't want to disclose? So I think he was talking again about um, when you were talking about the disclosure strategies. So I'm not 100% clear what he, uh, Vladimir, if you do want to clarify that or, or if you do understand what he's exactly what he's talking about there. Yeah, so if you don't want to file and you don't want to disclose and you still want IP protection, then um, in the realm of protecting functionality, all you've got is trade secret. So you've got to make sure there that everyone who has access to the invention is, is bound by uh, an obligation of confidence through some kind of written contractual language. You want to make sure you have the cyber and physical security measures in place. Oh, I'm on the phone. Sorry, some... Yeah, we need someone to mute, mute themselves. Uh, so uh, you want to make sure you have the physical and cyber security measures in place so that if you have to go enforce, you can actually show a court that you've taken reasonable measures to protect your trade secrets and it's not going to apply if when you commercialize, someone can reverse engineer the, the product. Because if someone can reverse engineer the product, what is in that product that has been publicly made available um, is not protected by trade secrets, even if you've done everything else. Okay. Um, to protect that product um, in a proprietary fashion, it's gotta be through patents. Good, good. Anyone else um, either in the chat or if you do want to unmute yourself and ask, you're, you're welcome to. This is our Q&A session, so let's wait a couple seconds, see if there's anyone. Oh. <laughs> okay, well, excellent. Maybe just switch to the next slide for a second. Sure. Okay. Do you see that? Yes, we do. So um, I just want to thank everyone for coming. This is, uh, you know, Foresight. We are here to um, help you with your clean tech uh, startup and with your, if you're interested in clean tech innovation or investment, uh, we've got lots of programs and stay tuned for what's, what's coming up. We've got a water next uh, water related uh, clusters happening. We've got a future economy series with our core cluster and lots of great things happening for the fall. If you just want to move to the next sure. slide. That is our next, uh, if you want to check out our next uh, webinars events, actually, if you just go to the Foresight site and click on events, it's all there, but that's the actual link if you want. Um, and did want to just wrap up, I really uh, thank you to, to Rock Ripley from uh, Gowling WLG um, for providing this great information for us. It will be recorded and put up on our website. And um, again, thank you very much everyone for coming and thank you so much uh, Rock for providing that great information. Thanks for having me, I'm happy to do it. And if anyone has any questions after the fact, um, feel free to call or email me. If you just Google me, you'll get my contact information. Um, or Diane can give it to you as well if, um, if that would work better. Perfect. And again, thanks very much. We're going to wrap up now. I, I noticed that Astrid has put the link in the, in the chat room. So there it is for our next upcoming events. Uh, thanks very much again. And thanks to Rog. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye.